Justin. Good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you again this morning. Uh, from wherever you are at, in the city, out of the city, out of the country, welcome. It's good to have you all with us this morning. Again, thank you, team. They're all sitting in the room out of uh, focus here right now, but thank you, team, for leading us in worship this morning. It's been such a joy uh, to be able to worship Jesus together in person, even in this small setting, and we can't wait to have a few more of you this week. I'm going to jump right into uh, our message for this morning, and uh, it's a question that I've been pondering for a little while, and, and really something that uh, I, would, I would like to make the adjustments in my own life and saying, how would Jesus respond to a situation like this? I mean, we might even say Jesus never lived through something like this in his time. And, um, and so what I wanted to do was just unpack that a little bit this morning. Let's see what the scripture says about that and take it from there and, and see where do we go? Like, what, what does he show us of what he did and what can we learn from that this morning? So we really are living in a historic time, aren't we? And uh, it's only time that we'll tell and we will look back in the future and we're going to look back and say, oh my goodness, do we, do we realize how significant a season we were living in? Um, can, there, there have been other historic times in the world. Um, there's times that our world has gone through significant things. Uh, in just the last century, we've had the, the two world wars that have been fought. Imagine living through World War I as we now know it's called. It was known as the Great War back then. Imagine living through that, and you're in year one, and then year two, and then you're, like, is this thing ever going to end? You, you, do, you have no idea in the midst of the moment. And then people have just recovered from that, and guess what happens? World War II hits. And, and year one, and year two, and people are dying, and the economy's crashing, and, and people are going, is this ever going to end? And it drags on for year after year after year. You know, the, the truth of it is, is that that's just our last century, and, and that's just two of the things that have happened. And I don't mean to be saying, well, oh my goodness, look at what a mess we're in, but truly, that's the state of our world. It, it's a mess, and, and it's desperately in need of a Savior. It's desperately in need of hope, and thank you, Kristen, for that great encouragement and reminder again. And we are purveyors, we are, we're, we're givers, we're carriers of hope because of Christ in us the hope of glory for the world around us. And when we stop and consider the mess of our world, we'll realize quickly it's a mess. There, there was once a time that there was actually a horrific disease that was going around. Uh, in fact, it was, it was so bad that people were considered to be so contagious that they were literally ripped away from their family units. They were taken out of town into a remote place, and they were kind of put all together in a little group and, and they were left to fend for themselves. In fact, the only way they survived was on the charity of others for food, for shelter, for clothing. And, and really, they were left there to die. In fact, it was a, a horrific disease to the point that there was no other way but death. And it was really contagious. And so they had to be separated. Imagine that moment where you discover that and you say goodbye to your wife and your children and your family for the last time and you get ripped away, never to see them again, and you live out your last days in agony. There was a time when that happened. And, and oh, while that was happening, there was also this tyrannical leader that was leading in the day. He decided that he wanted to rule the whole world, and he wanted to impose his ways on everyone by force. In fact, anyone who disagreed and was found to be standing against his plans, no matter how big or small, was brutally murdered. And, and that time, the disease was known as leprosy. And, and that king, that ruler, he was Caesar. But something else happened during that time. There was a baby born, and his name was Jesus. So let's understand, Jesus was born in the midst of some serious mess that the world was in. Now, if he was born in the midst of that, you know, my, my immediate thoughts would be one of, well, surely Jesus would do something about that. He had, he had sought out this leader and get rid of him. He would... Uh, he would he'd heal at this disease and get rid of that. But actually, we see Jesus had something very different on his radar. In fact, for the first 30 years, Jesus grew from a baby to a little boy to a teenager. And, and he gave his teenage, his, his teenage years, gave his parents some gray hairs. And in fact, they had to go and look for him, and they couldn't find him anywhere. And, and that's when he said to them, 
come on, mom and dad, you knew where I'd be. I'd be in my father's house. And there's some teenage stuff going on there, right? And then he gets into his 20s, and, and finally he turns 30. And at that moment when he's baptized, God releases him. And I can only imagine that there's this moment of discovery when they say, this is our Messiah, this is the one. And he had all of three years before he was crucified. And he went back to heaven. And, and we look at what we would have thought would be the things he needed to bring in his day and actually go, well, he did it. And, and what do we do with that? How do we handle that? Well, let's, let's look a little bit deeper into it. Uh, <laughs> Jesus was born in this historic and disastrous time, incurable diseases, tyrannical leaders, plenty of zealous religious people, immoral, evil, and godless living. In fact, that sounds a whole lot like 2020, doesn't it? Well, when we look at what Jesus did in the time, I, I think it would be good to consider, well, what would Jesus do? How would he live life in, in our time today? It's become such a cliched little bracelet on the arm, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But friends, it's probably the best question we could be asking of one another and of ourselves. In any decision making, in any which way we live, is what would Jesus do? How would he respond in this situation? What would he say about conspiracy theories? What about financial challenges, losing a job? What about loneliness, fear, uncertainty? What about the sick, the poor, others in need? What would he have to say about politics? Oh, let's not touch that one. What, what about the decision-making of our leaders? Actually, that's even worse. Don't go there. What about prophecies or apparent prophecies that are doing the rounds? And, wow. Okay, let's not even touch that one. What would Jesus say? What, what would you do? Well, let's start with this headline. God gives us some clarity right at the get-go. Because instead of looking at what he would have done or could have done, let's look at what, what's clear and what he was sent for. This, this is what the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 through 18. This is God's will. This is clearly God's will for his people, for us. It says, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be joyful always. Never stop praying. Thankful in all circumstances. Actually, that's what we're called to do, irrespective of the times we're living in, irrespective of what we're doing. And Jesus, it said very clearly, the scripture says that he came to seek and save the lost. Now, we can interpret that in many different ways, but that's what the scripture says. Do you know what it also says that we are to do? Ephesians 5 verse 1 and 2 says this, we are to imitate Jesus. Let me read it to you. Therefore, be imitators of God. I mean, there, there's no two ways. It doesn't just say followers. Some of the translations say followers, but even that original word translates right back to this word imitation. It means simply do what he does, say what he says, have courage like he has, don't do what he doesn't do, equally as important, and don't say what he doesn't say. It goes on to say, actually, in verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us. Walk just as Christ walked. In fact, in Acts 11, verse 26, uh, the people of the day came up with a derogatory uh, term for the believers, those who followed Jesus. And, and this derogatory term meant one thing. It meant, it, it was a mocking term that says, you're, you're like a little Christ. You're just a little imitation of who he is. You're exactly like him. And you know what that word is that we get our English word from? Is the word Christian. <laughs> they were called Christians first. At Antioch, the scripture says in Acts 11, 26. Go look it up. There it is. And since then, the whole point of that word Christian is to be little Christs, imitators of Christ. And, and they, they meant it as a derogatory, mocking way, but the recognition was you're doing everything he does. You're copying him. You're doing what he does. Well, let's have a look. What would Jesus say? How would he respond to some of these questions? What about conspiracy theories? I mean, just look. There's a lot of them. Google it. There's a whole bunch of things we could get caught up in. 
5G, this thing, that thing. I, I won't even go into the whole lot of it. But there's a whole lot. And whenever there is a crisis on our world stage, guess what? There are conspiracy theories abound. Plenty of them. So let's see what does the Bible say and how would Jesus handle conspiracy theories. Well, Isaiah 8 says this. And the, the headline in the New Living Translation, I love this. It says, this is a call to trust God. So that's the preface. This is a call to trust God. And this is what we are to do with conspiracy. The Lord has given me a strong warning. Let's hear that, church. What does the Lord say? He's giving us a strong warning. Not to think like everyone else does. Don't think the way the world thinks. In fact, it goes on to say this. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. That's the call. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one you should make that should make you tremble. He is the one that will keep you safe. Isn't that powerful? Do not dread what the world dreads. Not only do not dread, don't propagate what the world propagates either. Seriously, church, family, I do not see Jesus getting distracted by conspiracy theories. Or what about financial challenges or losing a job? Good question. Well, Matthew 6, Jesus says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Is money evil? No, it's not. But the love of money and being enslaved to money, that's what he's addressing here. And then this subtitle, do not worry. That's a word for us. Whatever challenges you're facing, Scripture says, do not worry. Why? Well, listen. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Who feeds them? Our heavenly Father. Are we not much more valuable than they are? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single day to your life? And the scripture keeps going. There's so much in there. Don't, don't worry about what you will eat or drink. Don't, don't worry about what you will wear. I mean, the scripture is talking about the fundamental basic needs of life here. And, and the scripture says this, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, because your father cares so much for the flowers of the field. How much more for those of us made in his image? That's what it's saying. What's the, what's the root that we need to delve into here? It's trust. Do we trust him? Is he as good and as faithful to his word as what the word says? That's our choice as to what we do. Well, what about loneliness and fear and uncertainty? Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I mean, that's, it's impossible. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I mean, not just conquerors, church. We are more than conquerors. I love that. Through him who loved us, Jesus. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor demons or angels or present or future or any powers, neither height or depth nor anything else in all creation. I think that's a pretty comprehensive list, right? Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is love. Isaiah 40, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. What is the position we need to posture ourselves in? Wait upon the Lord. What's the root of that? Trust. <laughs> Isaiah 49, 13. Sing for joy, O heavens. Burst. Into song, O mountains, rejoice, O earth, for the Lord has comforted his people, and he will have compassion on them in their suffering. What a promise from God. Do we believe this? Do we receive it? 
I, I could just keep going here. Like, well, let's look at the next one. What about the sick, the poor, and others in need? How would Jesus respond to people that are sick and that are poor and in need? Because what it's saying, remember all of these questions, when we look at the answers of what Jesus would do, here's the call on us. Imitate him. Don't do the other stuff. Do what he's doing. Mark 6, verse 56, wherever Jesus went, where, where, where was that church? Wherever he went. Into villages, towns, or countrysides. They placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And then a few of them who touched it were healed. I, I don't know what scripture you're reading, but mine doesn't say that. Mine says, all who touched it were healed. And you know, when you look across all the translations, that word all is all. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. And he said to us, greater works than me, you will do. That's the call Jesus has on his church. We've we got to take him at his word, and we've got to start living normal Christian living, not as if it was supernatural, but normal. That's normal Christian living. He's called us to this church. He's called us to rise up, step in His glory in us, on us, through us, His presence with us, His that, that hope that comes through us for the world. It's a gift for the world. Will we step up? Will we step in? Will we join Him? Luke 4 verse 18 says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Guess what, church family? The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. And he's upon me. Because, here's what it says, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Who? The poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's the heart of Jesus towards sick, poor, and needy people. That's our response. What about Matthew 25, 40? Truly I tell you, the king replies, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. That's Jesus. Whatever we did for the least, we did it as if serving him. That's the heart of Jesus. Well, what would he have to say about politics? Oh, well, would you look at the time? Maybe we should move on from that one. No, I'm not doing that. Let's hit this. Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was the Christ. He was what we have come to know, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He was the leader of all leaders. He still is. He had the right to rule over the entire nation of Israel, the, the whole world, the whole universe. But, but what we see when we look at the ministry of Jesus is he actually avoided any involvement in the current political issues of the day. That's right. He avoided any involvement in the current political issues of the day. And there were plenty of political issues to get at. Caesar, Rome trying to take over everywhere, the, the brutality of Roman soldiers, crucifixion. I mean, there were political hot potatoes wherever you looked. But nowhere do we see Jesus saying anything about that. I mean, he could have, with a snap of his fingers, he could have done something to eliminate that brutality. But he didn't. And you know what? We don't like it sometimes. And when we look at the injustice in our world, we look at the political climate around us, we want to do something and say something. The church, I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't make your voice heard. But let's let Jesus set the tone with what we do and how we do it. Could I, could I dare to call us to that kind of response? Can I challenge us with, with what we do and how we respond? The thing about Jesus is that there was nothing in his teachings, nothing in his life that gave even the slightest hint that he had political involvement. He refused to lead any political movement. He resisted when the people wanted to make him king. I mean, it, it says, John 6, 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He, he withdrew from confrontation with the leaders. Look at this, Matthew 12. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him. He healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. Here's the thing. He, he kept his eyes and his time 
and his energies and his, his emotions and everything about him. He kept himself pure and clean of all that stuff, and he focused on what the kingdom calling in his life was. Heal the sick, raise the dead, seek and save the lost. Church, remember what we're called to do. Imitate Jesus. And, and this one, which I think is so important. Do you, do you notice that the ones that were inciting people against leadership was the religious leaders of the day? And in fact, the only people that Jesus raged against were the religious leaders of the day. He walks into the temple and he turns the tables upside down because what they were doing is they were basically exchanging money and they were selling sacrificial lambs and doves and everything else. They were making money to keep their system going, to perpetuate their control. And it was, it was that that infuriated Jesus, is that they were, as they were keeping people in bondage. That's what he was against. Those were the only leaders that Jesus raged against. Not the political leaders, not the government leaders. Those leaders. You know what Jesus did not do? He did not incite people against the leadership of the day. They were evil. They were terrorizing people. They were crucifying people. They were imposing their culture and traditions. They were, they were killing off any sense of local tradition and pride of, of the Jewish people, of, of any nation around the world. Their, their whole mandate was to conquer the world. And you know what's ironic is that the very charge that the religious leaders brought to Pontius Pilate against Jesus was this. He stirs up, Luke 23, 5, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and he's come all the way here. That's what the religious leaders are accusing him of. How ironic. You know the thing about Jesus? He didn't get involved in any political debates. He just refused to get into debates. They tried to draw him in. Who? The religious people. Again, tried to draw him into debates about taxes and should we be paying Rome and, and it's just terrible what they're doing to us. But, but you know what Jesus does? Is he simply listens. He says, listen to what? Give to whom you have given. Give to God. Church, I, I'm not doing anything but pointing out what Jesus did and how he lived and how he responded and his call to our responsibility to imitate him. Man, this goes in the face of a lot of what we might feel like doing sometimes, doesn't it? What about the decision-making of the leaders of the time? I mean, surely he called them out on their decisions. But they made leaders all wise, all knowing. Well, actually, this is what was said in Romans 13. This is Paul who, who's instructing based on on what it is to imitate Jesus. He says this, everyone must submit. How many people? Everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. Again, it's rooted in the trust that all authority stems from God himself. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. You know, we've got to believe this sometimes because sometimes we look at it and we say, how could that be possible? But that's scriptural. So anyone who rebels against authority is actually rebelling against what God is teaching. That's what he says. We're going against God when we rebel against the authority. Church, we've got to hear this. This is the scripture. This is the rooted, established word of God. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 to 3 says what it's talking about now. How do we actually respond? Don't do that, but this is what we are called to do. I urge then, first of all, that you make your voice heard and you complain about government as much as you can. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what the scripture says. Got your attention yet? 1 Timothy 2. I urge then, first of all, first, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all of those in authority. Not just the ones we like. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And then this. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior. Yes, we vote. Yes, we be intentional. And God will hold leaders accountable. God will hold leaders accountable. Church, we need to hear that. He will hold them accountable. And when we start to act differently, 
what it's basically saying about us is we don't trust him in his ability to do what he's promised he will do. Ooh, that, that, that hurts, doesn't it? A bit of chiropractic adjustment going on. Lastly, let's look at this one. What about prophecies or, or apparent prophecies that are doing the rounds? Now, this is what the scripture says, Acts 17, verse 11. When, when we hear prophecies, and there are so many things that are buzzing through the internet and Facebook and all over the place these days, how do we respond? There, there's warnings and, 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 and um, uh, talk of fire and brimstone and all sorts of things. What do we do with these things? What do we believe? Uh, and you'll hear one prophecy that completely contradicts another one. How do we handle this, church? What do we do with this? Really good question. I'm glad you asked it. Acts 17 talks about the Berean Jews. It says that they were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. I want to I want to focus on that word character. It starts with strength of character. It starts with nobility of character. It's about character, brothers and sisters. That's the true measure. They received the message with great eagerness. Ah. Uh-huh. They responded to the message, but they examined what? The scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result of their eagerness and their examination of the scriptures, here's the, the fruit, as a result, many of them believed. We now know in hindsight that Paul was the main preacher. But they didn't necessarily know that at the time. The responsibility on them was to test that word, to bring it to the scriptures. Is this in alignment with God says it is, and what prophecy has said it is about. Church, guess who's responsible for that statement? It's not mine, it's yours. It's mine for me and how I interpret it, and it's yours for you and how you interpret it. And obviously, as a leadership team, we're committed to pointing towards those that are that we believe are of God. Church, it's the priesthood of all believers. It's your walk with God. And I want to encourage and challenge you. What are you doing for yourself, and how are you influencing the people around you with what God says? Well, what, what, is, what are the prophecies we should be following then? Well, that's a great question. How about this? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it very clearly says this. One who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. Those are big words, and it simply means, other translations, strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So here's one of my first measures of a prophetic word. Does it strengthen? Does it encourage and does it comfort? And if it doesn't fit the bill of those three, my first question is, God, is this really of you? I'm not writing it off just yet, but I want to understand because it hasn't met that first test. Let's now maybe speak with one of our leaders. Let's let's not propagate something that we're not even sure of ourselves. Amen? Church, I'm not shouting at us. I'm, I'm just deeply passionate about making sure that we live lives that are truly honoring and imitating like Jesus has lived in the midst of the crisis. Let me wrap up with this. I am deeply convinced that all of this is, is absolutely rooted in trust, in our ability or our inability to trust, to trust Jesus. And, and we, we've got to be deeply rooted in trusting Him. Because when we start acting differently or, or, or we're we're almost doing the work that God says he's going to be doing. You know what it's rooted in? It's mistrust. I don't trust God that you will do what you said or you're able to do what you said you would do. This is simply what Jesus came to do in the midst of the crisis. He didn't come to depose Caesar to incite a rebellion against Caesar. He didn't come to stir up a political debate. He didn't come to propagate conspiracy theories. He, he didn't come to, to give advice or he, he, he didn't come to, to get rid of leprosy. He came to seek and to save the lost. That's it, Luke 19.10. You know, the thing about Jesus' life, he didn't even come to, to perform many miracles to prove who he was. In fact, almost every single miracle in the scripture was completely an interruption to what he was doing or where he was going. Every single miracle, almost every single one, was an interruption. Here's what he did come to do. He came to make peace. And then he said this about us. He says, blessed are you, the peacemakers. He didn't say, blessed are you, the peacekeepers. 
the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker is a peacekeeper wants to just maintain any sort of semblance of peace, no matter how false it might be. Let's just kind of keep the status quo. Don't rock the boat. But Jesus came and he said, I have come to make peace. And he calls us. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers by nature are confrontational. We will stand up to what the devil is doing in our world today, and we will not back down. Understand, the spirit behind a lot of what's happening in our world today is the enemy. The enemy is not people. It's the enemy himself, the devil. Friends, we are living in difficult, we're living in challenging times, and he's calling us to rise up, to stand up, to be courageous, to be counted. And in our standing up, rising up, being courageous and being counted, let's make sure we're not on the wrong side of what he wants us and calls us to do. Because we can rise up, stand up, be courageous in areas that are actually contradictory to what Jesus has called us to do. Let's not be those people. Let's be imitators of Jesus and do what Jesus did. Like Peter, he invites us into stormy waters. And you see, the, the thing about the stormy waters, he was on a boat and 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 they saw this apparition and they were fearful. And he invites Peter to walk out into the water. And, and he could have stayed in a comf- comfortable boat. But, but Peter locked his eyes on Jesus and he walked on water. The place of Jesus' presence is in the stormy waters. It's not in the comfort of the boat. That's where he is. And, and all he says to us is keep my eyes locked on your eyes. Look at my face. Look at my face walk, come towards me. That's what Jesus says. Come. Come right onto the stormy waters. This is the place of my presence. This is the place of being courageous and standing up. This is what it looks like. Church, that's the place more than any that we should be pursuing. It's the storminess of the world around us. Get into the storminess and bring the peace and the presence of Jesus Christ in me the hope of glory to the world around me. Please, let's make sure we're keeping our eyes firmly fixed on his face. Let's not get caught up in the wrong battles here. We owe our families. We owe our neighbors. We owe our city. We owe our nation. We owe our leaders. An encounter with Jesus, the the very presence of Jesus. Again, Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory to the world around us. That's what we need to do is bring Jesus in his fullness. We get to bring his presence. We get to see his glory released. We get to see the fruit of that is revival. We get to see the church revived because you and I respond to Jesus. We imitate him. We do what he did. Nothing more, nothing less. And when we do that God's kingdom way and and against what the fleshly way is, guess what happens? That's the church comes alive. Revival breaks out and the kingdom of God pervades across our city. Amen. Jesus loved with everything in him, everything in him, even to the point of death. And you know what the central message of the Bible is? Be like Jesus. Church, God bless you. I pray that today would be a a good day for you to be stirred towards being an imitator of Jesus more than you've ever imagined possible. And if you need to find comfort in some of those things that you've got caught up with, please just listen again. Draw strength from those scriptures. Draw strength from what Jesus said, what Jesus did, who he is. And know that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. I'm going to just take a moment and pray for us. Invite Daryl, would you join me up here? And um, if if you've heard this this morning, you say, you know what, my life is just messy. I've got caught up in all sorts of things that I, I, I just should not have done. I shouldn't have got caught up in. I want to really challenge us this morning, church. Lay it down. Just put it aside and and get into the presence of Jesus. There is no simpler way to do this. Get into his the place. Put on worship music. Stop listening to the stuff. Stop reading the news. Stop getting on. Just put it all aside and put, put, I tell you what, put half the amount of time you put into that, into the word and into his presence worship and watch your life change. If you don't know Jesus, oh, you're missing out. (laughs) 
this is, this is the day that the Lord has made, and He has joy and hope for you. He didn't say it's all going to be easy, but He did say it's He's with you, and He'll be with me through the storms. Daryl, would you pray for us? Close our meeting, and then uh, we're going to go into a time of uh, the breakout rooms and just connecting together with some of the church family. It's such a joy to be with you, even in this format today. We love you, church. We miss you terribly. Can't wait to see you soon. Amen. Thanks, Daryl. What a great word. I tell you, I have been challenged by many of you this afternoon in this session. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for everyone today in this uh, this Zoom meeting. I thank you for your work that's going on in their life. And Father, I pray above all your you said that you wanted to know us and that you want us to know you. I pray we would put all the distractions aside during this time and just know you. Father, our hearts are to know you, to know how what you're saying and what you're doing and to fall deeper in love with you during this time. I pray today that as this message went forth, that people would be, that the things that have weighed them down, things they've watched, that those things would just fall off now in the name of Jesus. And that there, a freedom would come upon our church family, Lord, those who are watching today. And Father, if there's somebody out there that doesn't know Jesus, that behold, today is the day of salvation. That today would be the day they walk into relationship with you. There's somebody who's struggling, Lord, today, that today would be the day that they would know true freedom, Lord. And we thank you for this. Thank you for your word, Lord. Your word divides even to the bone and marrow, to the very deep things that we wrestle with. But, Father, I thank you that your word gives us life and truth so that we can truly know you. And so bless the church body today, Lord. Bless everyone that they would just walk in the freedom that you've called us to walk in in this time. That no matter what the world is saying, that we walk in the light of Jesus. We walk in the light and the freedom of you, Lord, today. And we give you the glory for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to remind you uh, on Wednesday, we do get to get together. 7 p.m. Prayer at I Berry to fill that strawberry hall. <laughs> It'd be great to see everybody. All right. Have a great time in the Zoom meetings. We love you all, and uh, we'll see you soon.